sun god Ra. I'm like the moon god Allah. I am the great one, Asa. I'm like a fly high in the sky from afar. Don't ya? I'm like the sun god Ra. I'm like the moon god Allah. I am the great one, Asa. I'm like a fly high in the sky from afar. Don't ya? All the things that I've seen I've been through crazy routines I've had some nightmares and dreams But I keep chasing all my goals Like I was part of a team I'm stacking brick on top of brick Until I start a regime I'm getting stronger I couldn't hold myself back any longer And them doubters trying to say I wouldn't make it They was wrong I take my heart and take my soul And put it all into this song And if your energy is bad Then just proceed to move along I'm a woman with integrity Dignity and energy I fellowship with friends And stay away from all the frenemies And if it doesn't kill you Then it only makes you better I don't care about materials Cause they can never measure I'm a leader and a diva I'm a teacher and a preacher I'm a loner and I used to be a stoner Now I'm either on my grind Or trying to reach another level Of this thing we call a life No more stress and no more strife I'm just trying to get it right yeah. Said I'm just trying to get it right I am the great one I am the moon god Allah. I am the great one, Asa. I like to fly high in the sky from afar. I come from the bloodline of Tutu Amin. Worshiping the sun like I'm hot and not in. Addicted to wisdom like it's oxy cotton. Leading the army like I'm Joseph Stalin. Toes are rotten. They have fallen like Adam in the garden of the knowledge. Stick to the ancient writers, you'll be solid. But the God I be, I'm happy and I'm full like the now. Christ consciousness since I was a child. From the Milky Way, they call it the Great Cow. Like a waterfall, I flow on and on. Like the sun god, I rise at dawn. I told you. I'm like the sun god, Ra. I'm like the moon god, Allah. I am the great one, Asa. I'm like the fly high in the sky from afar. Don't you? And blowing good And I've been grinding all my life Understand that yo, you'll probably be overstood I'm kicking back, celebrating like every day Off top like a toupee I'm chilling and I'm drinking on some Bombay There's a real one over here I'm a warrior Don't worry about what we be doing over here Just get your dollars up Your girl gon' probably follow, bruh When she see him moving like a boss And skirting off fast Leaving haters in exhaust I'm on GOAT status on top of the mountain at the peak In any game, I'm the MVP Go and ask about me And I bet you'll find nobody works harder for the pennies, nickels, dimes, and the quarters I'm always on the come up And I wish a perpetrator would run up And get popped like a freak about to get done up This movement that I'm on crabs in the barrels want none of I'm just elevating higher like KD when he played for the thunder I'm like the sun god rock I'm like the moon god Allah I am the great one, Asa I'm like the fly high in the sky from above Don't you? I'm like the sun god rock I'm like the moon god Allah
Uncle Josh and Neb, Life, Health, and Vitality. This is Menka Ushakim Ra Allah, and I'm coming to you today to discuss a very important topic. On today's live stream, we will be discussing Egyptian hieroglyphics in the Americas, from the Olmec to the Mayans to the Isthmians to the Mi'kmaq Indians. We have evidence all over North America, Central America, and even South America that the Egyptians definitely traveled to the Americas. So I have a short presentation that I put together for this just to get everything organized in a simple way. So we'll start with explaining how we got to this point in our research, the historical context of deciphering the language, as well as the problems that this causes for Egyptology, African studies and black Indian genealogy studies as well. So with all of that being said, let me share my screen and stop sharing this briefly. All right, so I have my presentation pulled up. I'm gonna make it full screen and let's get rid of this. Okay, so it should be full screen on your screens now. Again, the title of this broadcast is Egyptian hieroglyphics or metal nature in Olmec, Mayan, Isthmian, and by extension, the Mi'kmaq Indian scripts. As a subtitle to this, I titled it Implications for Egyptology, African Studies, and Black Indian Genealogy. So with all of that being said, let's give an overview of the topic, and then we'll talk about the implications. And I also have a book coming out March 1st called The Mu Thesis, A Study Decoding. 333 Egyptian, Olmec, Mayan, and Isthmian signs. And this work builds on the research of Judy K. King, who wrote the ISIS thesis sometime around 2008 or 2009. But it takes that research and it expands it into the Mayan language and the Olmec language as well. So let's do a quick overview of our sources. Um, one of the primary sources for my research in creating this book was America BC, Ancient Settlers in the New World by Barry Fell, specifically chapter 17, which is titled The Egyptian Presence. And in this book, it has so many images of hieroglyphics here in the Americas, from Iowa to Wisconsin to Canada, and multiple Indian tribes that definitely had a knowledge of the hieratic script. In addition, some newer research that I've recently stumbled across by Dean Clark, Egyptian Hieroglyphics in Olmec and Isthmian Inscriptions, a Comparative Study of Augmented Symbols. And we went back to the archives to look at what was published in the early 19th and 20th centuries. And we were able to discover this amazing work done by Augustus Le Plonhion, one book in particular, I highly, highly recommend everyone study and get, it's free for the public, is called Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. Also, Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and the Quiches, 11,500 years ago. Both of these books were pivotal in the formation of this research, and there are also other authors that were pivotal as well, such as Ivan Van Sertima, who wrote the African presence in ancient America. They came before Columbus almost 30 years ago. So rest in peace to our brother, Ivan. I'm oh, sorry, my phone's ringing. Rest in peace to our brother, Ivan Van Sertima. He's now an ancestor, but um, his work in proving the African presence in ancient America and specifically the African connection to the Olmecs was pivotal. Um, another great researcher, as Dr. David Imhotep, who wrote The First Americans Were Africans, and recently he actually updated it, expanded it, and revised some of his research with a new cover picture. And this cover picture that you're seeing here on the right is a realistic, well-preserved painting by the first Black Mayans. And this magnificent painting is located in room one of a three-room temple on top of a pyramid at Chiapas in Southern Mexico, which is located between Veracruz, Tabasco, and Guatemala. So these are the researchers that I built my research upon that inspired me and that led me to the path that I'm on today. So Hotepu. 
Now, we want to talk about bias because, again, when we talk about this topic, um, there's a lot of bias both inside Egyptology and outside Egyptology. Um, if we go back to the roots of Pan-Africanism and how it started, you know, in the early 20th century, it was a movement back to Africa to reclaim Black identity on the African continent. And in that movement, we made a lot of progress as a people. However, a lot of research was neglected right here in our homeland in the in the Americas. And we're going to see examples of this when you see people like uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing or, you know, someone like Asara Sudan Seti, people that come from the school of thought of the mystery system of the 90s didn't get much exposure to Black Indian genealogy studies. So examples of confirmation bias include not seeking out objective facts, interpreting information to support your existing belief, only remembering the details that uphold your belief. And this is the, the most important one to me, is ignoring information that challenges your belief, all right? And what is this belief? And basically, what am I alluding to? So the out of Africa theory, the key word is that it's just a theory. It's never been actually proven that all human beings originated from the African continent. However, has been widely accepted in you know, black circles, as well as pan-African schools of thought, as well as other schools of thought. Um, this out of Africa theory is transcendental and is very much ubiquitous with black studies. And as a result, I remember when I was in college, um, the Black Studies Department, before it was renamed to what it is named today, it was actually called Africana Studies. So the foundations of you know, race theory and the education of Black people in America has largely been controlled by people that have a bias against actually admitting who the indigenous people of this land are. Therefore, even if we are in a African-centered curriculum, there are still research areas that are neglected, such as Black Indian genealogy research, um, Omic studies as far as the language, culture, and religion of these people, as well as the other Black Indian societies that predate what we now call the Mayans and the Aztecs. So as a result of this, many individuals, especially Pan-Africans, may have a confirmation or explicit bias for considering new origin theories on African languages, specifically the language of Kemet, the Medu Netra. And this has to do with research that has been excluded from what we traditionally call the development of the Medu Netra in all its different stages. Um, now, we talked about the bias within Black spaces. Now, let's talk about the bias in spaces of whiteness or spaces that are non-Black. So Egyptology as itself is a, a bias already there because Egyptology was separated from the rest of African studies. You know, even though Egypt is on the African continent, due to racism and bias, Egypt had to be separated from the historical legacy and spiritual context with the rest of the African diaspora. So there's already a bias in several fields, including linguistics, the field of archaeology. And even here in America, there is a bias against the historicities of long lost peoples of ancient Americas. And this dates back centuries, many, many centuries. Um, works such as the sacred mysteries, for example, are considered to be pseudo or non-scientific. And even the author of this book, The Egyptian Hieroglyphics in Olmec and Isthmian Inscriptions, he took a shot at Augustus Le Plonion in the foreword for his book. Even though, keeping in mind, his research validates everything that Augustus Le Plonion said over 130 years ago. So that just goes to show you that bias has to be removed when we are doing research. Now let's talk about linguistic families because this is also, again, based on a biased framework and specifically linguistic families were formed based off the biblical idea of Noah's sons. 
Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Now, the Bible and any religious book, while it does have value for society, it cannot be used as a primary document because there are no dates in the Bible. And we have no historicity as to who these people are. We don't have any mummies of these people. We don't have any relics, any writings, anything. No first person accounts other than what we see in the Bible of the existence of Ham, Sham, and Japheth. So the Bible is not necessarily to be looked at as a, view, a book of history, but more so an amalgamation of many different writings from different civilizations, including Babylon, Egypt or Kemet, Chaldea, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Therefore, the entire foundation on which these genetic linguistic relationships and families of languages, the entire foundation of it has to be reassessed from an objective point of view. So these are just some examples of the different families that have been structured by linguistics in terms of where, what are the origin of these languages. So there's the Afro-Asiatic family, there's the Semitic family, and there is also another family. Um, forgot the third one. I believe the Proto-Indo-European family. So with all of that being said, if you look at how this is laid out, um, they have separated the Cushitic language families into North Kushite and Narrow Kushite. And then from there, we get Beja, Somali, Ometo. Notice they've separated the languages of Kush from the languages of Egypt. And even the Egypto-Semitic family gets divided into Coptic and Hebrew. Nowhere on this list is there any reference to India, which was the second great nation of Ethiopia. So the languages of Ethiopia would have to be directly connected to the languages of India. So with all of that being said, again, these are the two great lands of Ethiopia. We have Kush on the African continent right there as Lower Egypt or Upper Egypt, depending on your perspective. And then we also have the great Hindu Kush right here in India. All right. So these are the two great Kushite nations that are referred to by the early Greeks. Now, um, before I ask that question, a lot of people here may not be familiar with uh, Christopher Columbus's origin story. But if you go back to your early childhood books, they will tell you that Columbus accidentally discovered America and he thought that he was going to India. So that is why even now when we talk about the original people of this land, they're referred to as Indians, even though um, you can argue that Christopher Columbus would have had advanced knowledge to know that he wasn't traveling to India. But this raises certain questions about where really is India? Is India just the India we see in Asia? Or was there another nation of Indians outside of the Asian continent? Um, a good rhetorical question that I always throw in these short presentations is how were Native Americans and African slaves so easily converted to Christianity? Because you have to you know, imagine that we have a people living in a land for thousands of years, and suddenly these Europeans come over and they magically woo them into getting rid of all of their cultural practices, to getting rid of all of their sacred books, to getting rid of their language, you know, everything that makes these people who they are was somehow amalgamated and changed into Christianity. How were they able to convert these native peoples so easily? When we do some research, we'll see that a lot of the Catholic missionaries learned the native languages very well. In fact, they were even able to translate the Hebrew Bible directly into the languages of several Indian tribes. All right, and the reason that I'm bringing that up is because what I'm showing you here is a comparison of the Micmac hieroglyphics right here in America with the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So you can see here that there's a lot of correspondence. And this is also documented in America BC, which I showed you at the beginning. Um, here are some more correspondences between the Mi'kmaq and the ancient Egyptian language. And the meaning is right here on the left. 
So anyone with an Egyptian dictionary can go look up these symbols and anybody with a dictionary of Mi'kmaq can also look at these symbols and verify the meaning of these symbols. What you're looking at here are some examples of the script styles employed in formal hieroglyphic inscriptions. And what we are looking at on the left would be the most ancient form of ancient Egyptian writing, the Sesh Medunetcher. In the middle column, we have the informal or the hieratic or the cursive script of Kemet. And all the way on the right, we have another hieratic style that was found in the state of Iowa. And look at how close the, the cursive signs are. It's almost exactly the same. So the connection that you'll see over and over as I go through these slides, you will see that the hieratic script seems to be universally known from Iowa to Mexico to Wisconsin, all over the Americas. The hieratic script definitely transcended its primary location in Kemet. All right. So what I'm going to show you now is the opening of the mouth ceremony. And this is taken from They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima. The opening of the mouth ceremony in Mexico and Egypt. So what you see here is the opening of the mouth ceremony from the papyrus of Ani. All right. You can see here that there's a group of, of mourners standing before the casket where he is mummified. You see Anubis holding his casket. And you see a group of men holding some sort of arm or some sort of symbol near the mouth of the mummy. This is the opening of the mouth ritual. Next to it, we have a depiction of Osiris being given an offering. And we also have animals at the bottom scene. And what looks like um, a kepesh, which is a thigh of a bull being offered. All right. So now let's compare that to the Olmec opening of the mouth ceremony. And we will see a similar thing. There is a man with something in his arm and he's holding something out toward the mouth of a mummy, two ceremonial objects, just like we see two ceremonial objects right here in the Egyptian opening of the mouth ceremony. In addition, the wall painting comes from a cave at Juxtalahuaca. And there's a gigantic figure wearing lion skin. So pay attention to the, the attire of what you see in these rituals, because we're going to talk about the different skins that the priesthood wore during these times. So again, he's holding two ceremonial objects similar to the Egyptian before the kneeling man. Both priests are wearing skins of beasts whose tails hang between their legs. So you can see here, this is the tail hanging in between his leg. And if we go here, we can see here that there is again a tail hanging in between the leg right here. So hopefully you guys can see that. So those are the similarities there. Let's continue with some more similarities. Now let's talk about the leopard skin priesthood. All right, and this is where the research um, from Dr. David Imhotep is very, very key because, again, when he originally published the first Americans were Africans, we didn't have access to these morals. Um, and a lot of Black researchers, unfortunately, just weren't exposed to a lot of artifacts here, right here in America. So the leopard skin priesthood is an emblem of a secret society of Mayans and Egyptians who were in the mystery systems of their time. And only priests could wear leopard skin. All right. Now, where else have we seen this, this type of emblem in a priesthood setting before? We have seen this in Kemet for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, what you are looking at here is a tomb painting of Neking A, who is clothed in leopard skin in the mantle of a priest. And again, this is from an opening of the mouth ritual which I just showed you, has been found right here in the Americas in a cave. So this points to a relationship in terms of schooling as far as the cultural emblems, the initiation in the priesthood, and the detailed knowledge of masonry, pyramid building, 
and the congruity between the language. So it appears that they must have been from the same school of thought. And we're going to prove that to you now by looking at the Olmec crown and comparing it to the Desheret crown or the Egyptian African crown and the similarities between the two. So you're looking at, you know, several different crowns right here that right here in front of me is the Desheret crown, which again is the red or the green crown of lower Kemet. On the right is the Horus or the Hejet crown. And what they're really highlighting here is look at the antennas and the significance of the antennas on top of the crown. Also, another important part of the crown is the Ha, the H-A-H. So when we look at the Olmec crown, we see a Ha right here on the right. We see the Hejet right here on the left. And we also see the Ha symbol which is a symbol of the crown or the land of Egypt. We see that in the Omec crown. We also are looking at a designation that a person is a ruler of both lands. When we see this right here, this is a representation for a king. And it's saying that this king, who is a ruler, rules the upper and lower kingdoms, which is the same theme we see over and over and over again in Kemet. At, all the way at the bottom, we are looking at an Isthmian inscription, which has a royal title and the hay symbol right here, a twisted flax. Next to it, we have a bird, a nay, which is a royal bird, again, pointing to the symbol of hay or the H in YHWH. So going back to that question, when I asked you guys, why was it so easy to convert the Native Americans to Christianity. What if they already had their own form of Christianity here and even similar names for God? And what if the people that came here already knew this and already had a blueprint on how to conquer the Native Americans? Just a question, just a question. So now I wanna talk about the Sahara Sahara chakra, which is the, the crown chakra and the story of Ramayana. Now, if you look at the word Ramayana, then you see the word Maya in that, in that title. So the Ramayana is one of the most famous stories from India. And there are several similarities between the Indian story of creation with the Egyptian story of creation with the Chaldean story of creation and with the Mayan story of creation. So we have to look at the myths, we have to look at the culture, we have to look at the language, we have to look at the society in its totality in order to arrive at a proper understanding of the language. So when we look at who the Olmecs and who the Mayan people were, they were a people that obviously were very much in touch with nature, as you can see from their attire, they wore leopard skins, they wore lion skins, they mummified animals in the same way. So there's a lot of overlap from the crown system to the mythology, to the different poses and the knowledge of yoga among the, the first Americans. And also the crown is so significant because it's very rare to find two cultures that have similar crowns, let alone two cultures that are 3,000 miles apart, having anything similar as far as their crowns. So in summary, um, this is just an overview of a much broader research topic that I've composed into a book. But I think that it's good to start having these discussions because I see that a lot of people that come from different schools of thought, such as Pan-Africanism or, you know, other schools of thought, they're completely opposed to the idea of the aboriginals or black indigenous identity. And we will never progress as a people. We keep arguing over where we came from. So whether or not we came from Africa or whether or not we came from America, we do have to do more research and we do have to be willing to 
alter our previous theories of how we came to be. And so I'm going to end this um, by referencing probably the most significant archaeological find that I think I've come across in my many years of research. And what I'm talking about is the Davenport Steel. And basically the Davenport Steel is the Rosetta Stone right here in America. It was discovered and it had three different languages on it. One being hieroglyphic, one being Libyan, and I believe the third one was Isthmian. So it was essentially nothing more than a, a celebration of Osiris in Iowa. And here's an image of it. And what you're looking at is a depiction of the sky and all the different stars that are in the sky. And we can date this depiction of the sky based on where the stars would have been several thousand years ago. And we see Egyptian signs all throughout this, this stilla. We see the jet column in the middle. We see Ra rising on the right. We see worshipers hauling ropes to raise the jet column at the bottom. We see a ladder. And we see the mirror of the Egyptians. So it says the Jet Festival of Osiris as celebrated in Iowa around 700 BC. Explanation of the scene depicted on the Davenport steel. The hieroglyphs incorporated into the picture being here translated and also rendered in the formal palace style. The Jet column made of bundles of reeds and circled at the top by rings represents the backbone of Osiris in whose honor the jet column was erected each year on the day of the spring equinox. This information originally obtained by Adolf Ehrman from a tomb inscription of what looks like the 18th dynasty in Thebes is here completely confirmed by the inscription and illustration on the Davenport steel of Iowa. All right, and again, this original stone was called the Watcher Stone, later titled to be the Davenport Steel. And it is actually translated in this book, line for line. And again, it's kind of like the Rosetta Stone of America. And it's a shame that most people haven't studied it because it would completely change everything we know to be so-called true about Egypt. Here's another depiction of the Davenport calendar steel. And this was found in a burial mound in Iowa in 1874 by Reverend M. Gass. And it was found together with numerous other artifacts of North African and Iberian origin or relationships to this stilla. And what, again, we're looking at a celebration of New Year's Day, which is defined as the spring equinox when the sun passes Aries. And lastly, again, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, what you're gonna see as we do this research is that even though the primary Egyptian language in its, its most informal form was not known, let's say to most people, the hieratic script was. And here is a depiction on the left. We have the ancient Maya hieratic alphabet according to mural inscriptions. And these inscriptions are taken from a burial ritual in Mexico. And I will translate that in another video. But for now, I just wanted to just show you how similar the hieratic script is. On the right, we have the hieratic alphabet according to Champollion and Bunsen. And this was published in 1896, all right? So there's really no excuse for people th that are in this field, whether you're an Egyptologist or just someone that comes from the school of thought of Pan-Africanism to not be aware of this research. And this research completely obliterates, let me scroll up. This research completely obliterates all of linguistics. They would have to redo all of these family trees, you know, they would have to really change everything. So the question is, are people really just too lazy 
to redo what they believed for hundreds of years? Possibly. It's almost like asking people to stop going to church or stop asking Muslims to go, stop asking Muslims to read the Quran or something like that. It's going to be hard because people have believed these stories about the origins of our people for hundreds of years. So with all of that being said, we, we will have a part two to this where we'll, we'll get more into the Jed Festival of Osiris in Iowa, and I'll do some more reading as far as the similarities between the Mayan and the Egyptian language. So with all of that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this short video, and uh, thank you for tuning in. I will see you in my next video. Peace out.